Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. You know, as the uh, COVID crisis drags on now into its seventh month, it has raised significant questions about the way we're being led. Just this week, people have been asking, uh, you know, did the president ask quickly, act quickly and decisively enough when it became apparent that the coronavirus had hit our shores? Should a leader tell people the unvarnished truth or play things down so as not to cause a panic? Uh, has our governor abused his power by keeping us locked down too tight and too long? Or are we better off than a lot of other states for the way he has managed the crisis? People have all kinds of opinions these days about those in leadership, but whatever your opinion of our current leaders, it has become plain for everyone to see that leadership really, really matters. That's not only true when it comes to government, but in every other sphere of life as well. How you lead your family will affect every member of your family. How you lead at work will affect everyone that you work with. How you lead at school will affect every child in the classroom and will affect many of the parents as well. Leadership really matters. And that's true in churches too. A church needs the right kind of leaders. And that's the focus of the next passage of scripture that we're looking at in our series that we've called A New Normal. Now, I know that some of you are absolutely sick of that phrase, a new normal, because you don't want a new normal. You want your old normal back. But there are moments in our lives that, like it or not, require us to adjust to a new normal. 9-11 was like that, wasn't it? I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we couldn't greet our loved ones as they were coming off the airplane, meet them at the gate. Uh, all of a sudden, we had a whole new government agency, the TSA, and we found ourselves standing in long security lines with our shoes off and our toiletries in little plastic bags uh, for easy inspection. COVID-19, I think, is turning out that way. Uh, we're being told that mask wearing and social distancing may last well into 2021. I heard a podcast this week in which some of the participants were saying that the effects of COVID may be felt as long as, as 2024. And that some of the adjustments that we've been making in recent months may end up being permanent. Well, Jesus' ascension into heaven was a moment like that for the apostles. It was a, a, a ground-shaking, paradigm-shifting moment that would require them to adjust to a new normal. Jesus, uh, their leader, has just been taken up from them into heaven. They've been told to wait in Jerusalem until they receive the Holy Spirit, whatever that meant. They've been told that when that happens, they will be empowered to be witnesses for Jesus in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And many of them had never set foot outside of Israel. They would much rather have had Jesus with them, hanging out with him, having meals with him, listening to him teach, watching him do miracles and, and feed the hungry. But he's gone. And they're going to have to figure out a new normal without him. And when your world has been rocked like their world was rocked, and you're trying to adjust to a new normal, it sure helps in situations like that to have the right kind of leaders. Where do you even start? when your world has been rocked the way their world was rocked? Where do you even start when you're, you're trying to figure out what's next? 
You've just watched Jesus taken from your sight into the clouds and you've been promised that he's going to return again one day in the same way that you've seen him go. You've been told that in the in-between time, between his, his ascension into heaven and his coming again, you're going to carry on the work that Jesus commenced and you're going to become witnesses for him to the ends of the earth. But you're not to leave Jerusalem until you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that work. And you don't know how long that's going to take. So what do you do? Well, verse 12 tells us, it picks up the story where it says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, the place where Jesus ascended into heaven, the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away, just a, like a third of the mile outside of the city. And when they had entered Jerusalem, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. Notice there are 11 apostles mentioned there. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. I think it's instructive that in this awkward in-between time when they don't yet know what to do, you know, their old normal is gone and they don't yet know what the new normal is going to be like, I think it's instructive that in this awkward in-between time, their first instinct was to pray. Look, when God has closed one chapter of your life but hasn't yet opened the next chapter, the very best thing you can do is pray. Lord, show me what's next. Lord, prepare me for what's to come. Lord, have your way in this. I surrender to whatever you want. And it's as they pray that something becomes pretty obvious to Peter. They're one apostle short of a full deck. They need someone to take the place of Judas Judas Iscariot, who betrayed their master. And so in verse 15, it says, In those days Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. So it was the apostles, Mary, the other women, the brothers of Jesus, and then a a bunch of other people too. Peter says, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted to share in this ministry. He's saying, I know it's baffling. Judas was promised by Jesus right along with the rest of us that one day he would sit on one of the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, but he forfeited all that when he betrayed our master, and now he's dead. And Luke includes this kind of parenthetical comment in verses 18 and 19 to speak of the manner in which Judas died. It says, now this man, Judas, acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, all his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is field of blood. Now, if you're, you know the Gospels, you know that this account is a little bit different from the way Matthew describes things. In the Gospels, we learn that after betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he tried to return the money to the chief priests, but they wouldn't take it back because now they said it's blood money. We can't put that back in the temple treasury. Judas was upset with them and threw the coins into the temple and went off and hanged himself. The the chief priest took that money, Judas' money, and they used it to buy a field. And so that's why the book of Acts says that that this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And the chief priest took this money and bought a potter's field as a burial ground for foreigners. And here in Acts we learn that this place was called the field of blood, perhaps because it was purchased with blood money, but it may also be because Judas hanged himself and when he was cut down, his body fell to the ground in this, in this field, his corpse bursting open. That's the way scholars generally harmonize the two accounts, Acts and, and Matthew. And suffice it to say, Judas died in a hideous way. But much as the other 11 may be angry and confused about what Judas did, Peter shows that it was all in fulfillment of Scripture. It had to happen this way. 
For it is written in the book of Psalms, he says, and and here he's citing Psalm 69, verse 25, a psalm that talks about the enemy of Messiah, and it says, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. In other words, may the dwelling place of the foes of the godly Messiah become a desolation. It's not enough that he gets what's coming to him, but may his home become a ruin where no one will ever live again. And let another take his office. Here, Peter is quoting from a second psalm, Psalm 109, verse 8, which is a curse on one who betrays a friend and repays evil for good, which is exactly what what Judas did to Jesus, repaid evil for good. And so based on this biblical reflection, let another take his office, Peter has a proposal to make. We need to replace Judas. Judas. Devoted to prayer and guided by scripture, Peter says we need a 12th. We need someone to take Judas' place. Because here's what Peter grasps that the others perhaps haven't figured out yet. If their movement is going to have any credibility as a Jewish movement, if they're going to make a claim to be the people of Messiah, a new movement uh, advocating for, the, for people to follow after Israel's Messiah, then they would need a 12th man. If they're going to witness in Jerusalem and in Judea, then they need to present themselves as any respectable Jewish community or Jewish movement would, and that would require a 12-fold witness, especially to represent themselves as the people of, of, of Messiah, the culmination of Israel's hope. They would have no credibility whatsoever claiming to be the true people of Israel's Messiah if there were only 11 of them, 12 tribes, have to be 12 apostles. 11 just won't do. For any Jewish community to be legitimate, it needed a council of 12, like the Qumran community down along the Dead Sea where the Dead Sea Scrolls were copied. They had a ruling council of 12, and that was very common in Jewish circles for there to be a a council of 12. And Peter understands that, that it matters. It matters because leadership matters. But he also understands that they need the right kind of leadership. Not another Judas, but someone who would help give credibility to their claims and to help advance their mission as witnesses of Christ. The church hasn't even come into existence yet officially. But Peter rightly understands that in the days to come, they're going to need the right kind of leadership. And so also for every church that ever has been or ever will be, a church needs the right kind of leaders. And in what happens in the rest of the chapter, it shows us what kinds of leaders, what kind of leaders churches need. To begin with, I want you to see that churches need leaders who are qualified. Churches need leaders who are qualified. In verse 21, And following, Peter talks about the qualifications of this new leader that will replace Judas. He says to the people gathered there, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. You see, not just anyone can be an apostle. Not just anyone can take Judas' place. Whoever's going to take that 12th spot must be qualified to do so. First, Peter says, they have to have been with us the whole time, from the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, when he was baptized by John in the Jordan, until the very day that we saw him taken up from us into heaven. Now, this infers, of course, that that there were more than just 12 in Jesus' entourage, In fact, we can see that in in the fact that there are 120 gathered here in in that upper room, devoting themselves to prayer. These were very likely a a big part of the entourage that that traveled around with Jesus wherever he went. There were the the 12, there were the women, there were uh, other people, for instance, the, the 70 whom Jesus sent out on a preaching mission two by two throughout Galilee. And, and what Peter is saying here is, 
that though the 12 had that special place in Jesus' inner circle, there were many others, and, and some of them were with us from the beginning and all the way to the time that Jesus ascended into heaven, and they need to be able to give witness to all that Jesus taught and all that Jesus did along with us. Whoever takes Judah's place must be from that group. They need to be able to tell the story of Jesus from the beginning, from firsthand experience, and most important of all, they need to have been witnesses with us of Jesus' resurrection. Why? Because the whole gospel hangs on it. You see, if Jesus died and, and stayed dead, who would ever believe that he had conquered sin and death for us? Jesus not only died on the cross, giving his life of infinite worth as the only adequate payment that could be made for our sin, but he rose from the dead to prove that he has forgiveness of sin and eternal life to offer to all who repent and believe in him. Without the resurrection, there is no good news in the gospel. And whoever takes Judah's place must be willing to back with his very life his testimony that Jesus not only died, but that he rose again. This is the story that's going to be told in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Whoever takes Judah's place must meet that qualification to become with us a witness of the resurrection, Peter says. You know, it's important to note that the church has always had clear qualifications for its leaders. You know, the apostles would eventually die off. I know there are people that go around today calling themselves apostles, but the apostles died long ago. To be an apostle, a true apostle, you had to have been a witness of Jesus' resurrection. And they all eventually were martyred or, or they died like John, a, a natural death. But the apostles are long gone, but churches still need leadership. And so Paul, for instance, in his letters to Timothy and Titus, told them that wherever you have churches, you need to find leadership for those churches. And he gave them qualifications for those leaders, for elders and for deacons. And those qualifications are clearly laid out for us in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. Listen to these qualifications for an elder, for somebody to be an elder of the church, a pastor, a shepherd of the congregation. Paul said they must be above reproach, Husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. He goes on to say that they must not be given to much wine. They must not be violent but gentle. They must not be quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well. His children obey him with proper respect. He shouldn't be a recent convert. He should be of good reputation with outsiders. He needs to be blameless, have children who believe, not wild and disobedient. He should not be overbearing, not quick-tempered, not pursuing dishonest gain. He needs to love what is good, be upright, holy, disciplined, and hold, hold firmly to the trustworthy message. And you say, wow, that is a tall order. And it is. And the only way anybody could ever live up to that order is if they are in Christ and, and, and Jesus is living his life through them. In other words, look for somebody who looks a lot like Jesus. That's who you want to lead your congregation. Now notice it doesn't say anywhere in those qualifications that you need to choose those who are popular, good-looking, wealthy, powerful, or successful. That may be how the world chooses leaders. The world may be drawn to such leaders, but just because someone is rich or powerful or successful doesn't mean they're fit to lead the church. A church needs the right kind of leaders. Godly character is what qualifies them to lead. You know, I've been closely involved with, I guess, eight different churches in my lifetime, and they fall into roughly two categories uh, for each. On the one hand, there are those that understood this principle, and the other half of them didn't understand this principle. Half of them chose leaders without regard for the biblical qualifications, and they tended to choose people who were successful in business, who were big givers, who had been around a long time. Half of the churches, on the other hand, took the scriptural qualifications very seriously, and they chose godly men to lead the church. In, in one case, they chose a, a high school dropout who worked in a hardware store but was a man of, of prayer. 
He wasn't the kind of person the world would ever look to as a leader. But he became an elder in one of the churches I led. Now guess which churches fared best? I can tell you that those that didn't pay much attention to the biblical qualifications for church leadership were the ones that always seemed to be full of drama. They always had church fights going on. They never seemed to be able to get on track. They were ineffective in reaching people for Christ. Pastors resigned in frustration, and one of those churches even split right down the middle. Those that paid careful attention to the biblical qualifications for church leadership were typically very healthy. They enjoyed greater unity and harmony. There was forward movement and growth and effectiveness for the gospel. You know, one of the reasons I believe God has so richly blessed Bayside in recent years is because we have made a point of choosing the right kind of leaders, leaders who are qualified. Every church needs them. Churches need leaders who are qualified, and secondly, Churches need leaders who are recognized. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, Peter is addressing this gathering of 120 followers of Jesus who have been devoting themselves to prayer. He's told them about his conviction that they need to replace Judas. He has stated the qualifications for that replacement. And almost immediately, the group puts forth two nominations. It says in verse 23, and they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. So they put forward two names, Joseph and Matthias. Now, there are a couple of things I find very interesting here. First of all, the 11 apostles didn't just huddle off by themselves to pick Judas' replacement, you know, in a a back room filled with cigar smoke. You know, they they didn't go in the back room and, and do this on their own. They opened the process up to and invited the participation of the 120. A second, when the qualifications were stated, there were two men that everyone recognized almost immediately met the qualifications. In other words, these two were well known to the group. They had a track record. They had been involved the whole time. They had traveled together. They had shared meals together. They had witnessed miracles together. They had watched Jesus die. They were among those who saw Jesus alive from the dead. They had a track record, and everyone recognized because of that track record that they fit the bill. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got as a young man aspiring to enter the ministry was from a denominational executive. He was the the president of the church association that my home church was part of. And he came to preach at our church one Sunday. And after the service, I went up to him as as a college student. I said, Dr. Shive, I, I believe I'm called to ministry. What advice do you have for me? And without even pausing, he said, build a track record in ministry. Whatever you do, good thing that you're going to college, get your seminary degree, great. But whatever you do, get involved here in your local church and let people see what you can do. They need to be able to affirm. They need to be able to recognize that God has indeed called you to ministry. You see, people who rise to church leadership should be able to be recognized by the congregation. One of the ways you know someone is ready for church leadership is when you say you're looking for individuals who meet certain qualifications and people say, oh, well, that's Paul, that's Chris, that's Ken, that's Daryl, that's Dave, that's Andrew, that's Ed, that's Ralph. That's Sam. By the way, those are our current elders. And one of the ways we involve the members of Bayside Chapel in selecting and identifying new leaders is by asking you to participate, by giving your suggestions. And so out in the, uh, next to the church office, there is a, a little pickup box on the wall where you can pick up this form. It's called the Elder Nomination Process Form. And in this form... Uh, there is an explanation of all of the, uh, the, the qualifications of eldership, what each of them mean. And on the back of the form, there's a place where you can, you can say, I believe these are people should be considered to become elders of Bayside Chapel. You give their name, positive reasons why, and you can list any reservations that you might have at the same time. You can pick these up the next couple of weeks. They're due back on October 11. And by the way, if you're watching online or you find it more convenient to do so, there's a a place in the app where you can access that form and fill it out online. 
They'll come straight to me. And then we take all of those suggestions and the elder board will, will carefully go over them. And we'll pray about those names that have been offered. And we'll have some discussion about the individuals and whether they're a good fit. Uh, whether they have a track record in ministry, whether they are already doing the kinds of work that elders or shepherds do. You know, are they teaching? Are they leading a group or ministry? Are they caring for and discipling the people in their sphere of influence? And we'll have conversation, we'll pray over those names, and then we'll have some conversation with some individuals, and before long, we'll be presenting some names of potential new elders to the congregation, to the membership, for a vote. Now, why do we go through such a rigorous process? Because a church doesn't just need leaders, but the right kind of leaders. Churches need leaders who are qualified and recognized. And thirdly, churches need leaders who are prayed over. Churches need leaders who are qualified, recognized, and prayed over. You see, at this point in the story, these followers of Jesus have a problem, don't they? They've got two equally qualified individuals to choose from, and they can't have both because 13 apostles would be just as awkward as 11. And so they've got to choose between the two. They can only have one. And how do they do that? Well, maybe you say they they take a vote right away, right? They, they, They find out who's the more popular. And the answer is no, that's not what they do right away. They pray again. It says in verse 24, And they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his place. Lord, you show us which which of the two. You know the hearts of of men. We, We don't. To all appearances, they both look good. They both built a resume of of faithfulness to Jesus that has been observed and, and recognized. They, they both are well known to the group and they meet the qualifications of having been with Jesus and they can attest firsthand to his resurrection. How do you choose when they both look so good? Well, that's where the prayer comes in. There's a part of this that only God knows and they need God to show them because God is the only one who can look at the hearts of each man. This is a principle that goes all the way back to the Old Testament when Samuel was sent to the, the household of Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel. And he met the sons of Jesse, one after the other, from the oldest on down. And each one who came before him looked like a great candidate, you know, strapping big, strong young men. And person after person, God said, nope, it's not him. It's not him. It's not him. It's not him. Until they got to the end of the sons of Jesse. And, and Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the sons you have? And he said, oh, no. No, we got one more. Scrawny little David. He's out there tending the sheep. And, and, got, and uh, Samuel said, well, bring him in. And the moment that, that he came before Samuel, God showed Samuel clearly this was the next one to be anointed the king of Israel. Because, it says, There in 1 Samuel, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You see, these people here in Acts chapter 1 are asking God to look at the hearts of these two men and reveal to them which is the better pick. I want you to, to see here that this choice was prayed over. And I want us here at Bayside Chapel to always follow this example in choosing leaders for Bayside Chapel. Let's make sure that in our selection of leaders that our leaders are prayed over like crazy. It was about 10 years ago when Bayside was looking for a new pastor. And I'd put my resume in and gotten a contact that You know, let's have some conversations, and those conversations were progressing, and and along the way, I began hearing about this prayer emphasis that was going on here among the the people of Bayside. People were praying fervently for the work of the search committee, and, and, and they were bathing this effort in prayer, and as it was coming to a culmination, there was a prayer vigil that went around the clock, 24 hours, somebody here that whole time praying that that the church would select the man of God's choosing for this position. Boy, I am so glad 
that you invested that effort in prayer because you know what? There was a lot about me you could observe. You could look at my resume. You could watch me preach. You could, you could ask me questions. You could see how I interacted with people in, in conversation, but only God knew my heart. You were wise to pray for discernment for that very reason. So let's make it a point to really, really, really pray over the selection of new leaders for Bayside Chapel. And so I'm asking you, before you fill out this form or submit it through the app, pray. Pray about your suggestions. As the elders consider those who are suggested, pray. Pray for the elders, for wisdom and discernment. When we announce at a membership meeting and, and put nominees before you for a vote, pray. Pray for that meeting because a church needs leaders who are qualified, recognized, and prayed over. Qualifications are useless if the heart isn't right. Remember I told you about that one guy in one of my previous churches who became an elder, uh, never had a high school education, worked in a hardware store for most of his life, but was a, a man of real prayer. Well, we were going through a cycle of selecting leaders for our church at the time, and we had some, some really fine people we thought might make good elders, and one of them was a guy I'll, I'll call Donald. Donald was well known to the church. He was recognized, if you will. He was qualified in so many ways. He was teaching an adult Sunday school class. He was a real shepherd to that, that group of, of young adults, and, and uh, he, he seemed to have godly character and and everything, he checked all the boxes. And I think most all of us were ready to say, let's ask Donald to, to come and join us as an elder. But that one elder I was telling you about, the guy without the high school education and, and who worked in a hardware store, he, he was the one who said, you know what? As I've been praying about this, I, I just don't feel right about it. He says, I can't tell you why. Uh, I, I like Donald a lot, but I just don't feel like I can vote for him right now. And we all took a step back because we respected Creed's discernment so much. And we said, look, Creed, if you're uncomfortable with this, we won't approach Donald, at least not with this round. Maybe we'll come back to it later. But if you don't feel comfortable about it, we're not going to pursue this. Well, wouldn't you know, about six months later, about six months after the time we would have made Donald an elder of the church, it was discovered that he was having an affair with a woman in the church and was about to leave his wife. God saved us from a major disaster because that was a decision that had been prayed over. And, and one of our elders was being really attentive to the Spirit's voice and warning us off. You see, a church needs leaders, but it needs the right kind of leaders. It needs leaders who are qualified, recognized, prayed over. And finally, churches need leaders who are appointed by Christ. Christ. It's his choice, ultimately, who leads his church. More than anything else, we want to be led by those Jesus has appointed to lead his church. And so what did they do here in, in Acts chapter 1? They prayed and they cast lots. <laughs> it says in verse 26, and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, it might seem unusual that they would cast lots in this situation, but casting lots was recognized in the Old Testament as a way of discerning God's will. You ask God to show you what to do, and you cast lots, whether it was, I don't know if they drew straws or, or tossed dice or flipped a coin. I'm not sure how they did it, but it says in Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And so they pray, show us which one of these two you have chosen. And then they cast lots, and the lot falls on Matthias, who actually turns out to be a really excellent choice. You know, he's not mentioned anywhere else in Scripture, but neither are most of the other apostles. Pretty much it's James, John, and Peter, and then Paul, who are, who are the main actors in, in the Gospels going forward. But according to the ancient church historian Eusebius, Eusebius Matthias, who he says was one of the 70 appointed by Jesus back in Luke chapter 10 to go out on that preaching mission two by two throughout Galilee. So he had a track record of ministry already. But not only was he one of the 70, but he became, as an apostle, the apostle to the Ethiopians. He was the missionary that took the gospel into Africa. Now you might be asking, well, you know, why don't we choose pastors or elders that way by drawing lots? Well, for one thing, 
This is the last time Jesus, ever, Jesus followers ever make a decision that way. Because once they receive the Holy Spirit, which happens in Acts chapter 2, stay tuned, once they receive the Holy Spirit, now they rely on the inner guidance of the Spirit to help them in their decision making. And so when the elders of Bayside proposed new leaders and put them before the congregation for a vote, it's because we trust the Spirit of God who dwells within each of us who follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. We trust the Spirit to guide us in that decision. And when there is overwhelming agreement on the part of God's people and dwelt by His Spirit, we take that as, as Jesus having revealed His will to us. As we often say, when we vote for somebody to become an elder, it's not that we make them an elder, but that we are recognizing the one whom God has made an elder in our midst. I'm grateful, aren't you, for the example of these followers of Jesus who are waiting to see what their new normal is going to be like, and they're in this awkward in-between time, and, and they choose to give serious attention to the need for the right kind of leadership, leaders who are qualified, recognized, prayed over, and appointed by Christ. Every church needs leaders like that. And I frankly can't think of a time in my lifetime when churches were more in need of this kind of leadership. Because we're being told by experts that for a variety of reasons, church attendance may never return to pre-COVID levels. We're being told that the pandemic may bring about the demise of as much as 25% of churches that were in preservation or life support mode before the pandemic began, and the crisis as an accelerator of change is only going to lead to their, their demise sooner than later. We're being told that building-centric models of doing church have to be re-examined because how do you do church when you can't gather in the building? And make no mistake about it, a new normal has already been forced upon us by COVID as we were forced, for instance, to rethink how church is done. Instead of focusing on what we can't do anymore, we're asking what we can and must do to continue to advance the gospel in our community and around the world. For instance, by being forced to go online in March, we gained a whole new audience around the country. And we've had to begin asking questions like, how do we pastor people who can only ever attend online? How do we engage them in the life and ministry of Bayside? How we, do we disciple them? How do we improve our online presence? Do we need to have someone on staff, for instance, designated as the pastor of the online congregation? And then there are a whole host of other considerations about how we continue to safely reopen for those who, who are going to come back. And then there's a crisis looming as, as the mental and emotional toll of the pandemic becomes apparent. How do we respond to that? As frustrating as this time has been, there is opportunity before us to meet people in need with the hope of the gospel like never before. And so I choose to believe that Bayside's best days, our greatest impact for the gospel is still ahead of us. How about you? And to lead us into that future, that new normal, we will need leaders who are qualified, recognized, prayed over, and appointed by Christ himself. Will you pray that God continues to raise up such leaders for Bayside, and not just for Bayside, but for Wellspring and for Proving Ground Church too? And while you're at it, please continue to pray for our current elders and staff that God will give us wisdom and strength as we seek God's direction for our new normal. You know, the future is likely to look somewhat different from the past, and that may be disconcerting, but it's not necessarily bad. Like the 120 believers in the upper room that day, even as they were about to find out, stay tuned for next week, when God leads you into a new normal, it's likely to be powerful and life-changing. In fact, I go so far as to say it's likely to be powerful and world-changing. And so we wait and we pray in this awkward in-between time. And we trust in him who promises, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We trust in him because he is faithful. Let's pray. 
Father, we are so grateful for the example of these first believers, for the wisdom that you gave them to take such great care in choosing new leaders for the church. And Lord, in these crazy in-between times in which we live, we pray, Lord, that you would raise up godly leaders, qualified, recognized, prayed over, and appointed by Christ himself. Lord, we pray for wisdom and strength for our leaders, that we would lead well and, and not give up hope, but lead in such a way as to help us take advantage of this crisis moment to reach people for Jesus, to advance the gospel in our community and to the very ends of the earth. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.